turn now back to Exodus chapter 10 for the preaching of God's word. Thank you, David, for reading to us Exodus 10. Before we hear the message on Exodus 10, let's ask the Lord to bless the preaching of this passage. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come again to you and we plead the assistance of you, O Holy Spirit, that you'd open up our eyes that we might see wonderful things in your word. We pray, O Lord, that truly the the speaking and the hearing of your word is like the unfolding of light, and that light would come to us this evening and would radiate brilliantly upon our faces, O Lord, that we might behold the God who is immortal and invisible, the God only wise. We worship you tonight. Help us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. In Exodus 10. Our title tonight is Devastating Locusts and Darkness. I'd like to do something a bit different for our introduction. I'd like to do somewhat of a encouragement in our personal study. I'd like to talk about hermeneutics. Hermeneutics. What is hermeneutics? Well, it's a word that means to interpret. How do we interpret the scripture? It's a Latinized version of Greek Hermeneutics, it means to interpret the scripture. And how do we do it? How do we determine what this scripture is saying to us? For many of us, we make observations. And from those observations, we make intelligible or learned interpretations. And then from there, we make applications to our own hearts. But yet, in those observations, in those interpretations, it's a bit tricky. How do you make sure that you're saying or you are intending the right thing? How do you know that you're saying what the Scripture wants you to say? Or perhaps better, how are you interpreting what Scripture wants you to interpret? We do this all the time, don't we? You hear it twice on Sunday. You do it for your preparation for studies that you lead or teach. You do it in your own personal devotion. How do you do it? How do you do it rightly? As there is in many things, there's a million wrong ways to do it, and only a couple that are right. How do you make sure you're doing the right things? Let's say this, at least, that you want to make sure that you are saying what the Scripture is saying. You want to say what the scripture is saying. And you want to make sure that you're saying what this scripture is saying. I find it a marvel that there are a lot of great sermons that are preached on wrong texts. That is to say that the text itself doesn't teach what the message about. And though the message is a great message and ministers to your heart, it's not actually what this passage is saying. It's actually another passage is saying that. And really, what the person is doing in the middle of that exposition or in that interpretation or in your private study, you're leaning heavily upon the revelation of another passage to to say that this is what this passage is saying. But there's a problem with that. Why not preach or teach, or study that passage? Why not look to that passage? What do we see in this passage? And see that there's, that is also another error, is that many people, when they hear a sermon, or when they hear a teaching, what they desire is, they desire a overall theology message. That is to say, I want to know how this passage actually agrees with the rest of Scripture, and endorses it and fits together. I want to know that. But to say that, it is problematic because you perhaps are missing the revelation in this passage. God revealed scripture and every word is living and active. Every word is beneficial, profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and the training in righteousness. The man of God might be thoroughly equipped, right? This word, and so the, part of the difficulty is, is when you're studying, and particularly when you're seeking to deliver the message, is that you need to be saying what this passage is saying. Now, sometimes it's not as grandiose and exciting as other passages. 
And it's appealing to go to those passages and rely upon those passages, not this one, those passages for your message. But you can't do that. You have to do the hard work and even wrestle with what is being said in this passage. If for example, we looked at frogs and bugs, we looked at the heifers, hot spots, and, and hail, and tonight we look at devastating locusts and darkness. What do we learn here? Now, it is very tempting of me tonight to appeal to another scripture. That is particularly of Deuteronomy 33.4. Deuteronomy 33.4 relates to us the teaching that when God, when he judged Pharaoh, that he was making a mockery of the Egyptian gods. He was actually telling them that this was not, this was wrong. I'm mistaking that passage. I need to look that up again. Something did not record right my transcription of that. But the scripture says in other places that when God was judging Pharaoh with all his plagues, that he was judging the gods. And what you have there is this assumption is that every single plague that was putting that God was using is that he was using each one against the supposed gods of Pharaoh. But that's actually an assumption. He doesn't actually say this. And on top of that, the, the greater difficulty when you look back at Exodus is that God here, through his servant Moses in the book of Exodus, does not talk about the foreign gods at all. On the contrary, he rather says another theme. Theme of that you may know that I am the Lord. A theme that he talked about in chapter 3. That I will make myself known. I am who I am. You're going to see who I am. And really, the difficulty is understanding how these plagues actually reveal who God is. How, what can you learn from frogs and bugs, heifers, hot spots, and hail? What can you learn from darkness and devastating locusts about the Lord? Well, that's the challenge that is before us. How does this passage teach us more about God? Well, I have a couple of points in my own personal wrestlings with this, and I would love your dialogue later about it. But here is what I have become convicted as to what this passage is teaching us this particular passage, chapter 10. I think it's teaching us two things. One, that God acts so that we might know him. God acts so that we might know him. So here we're really looking and wrestling with verses 1 and 2. This is perhaps the new portion of the, the plague narrative. It's where he, he talks about why he is doing what he is doing. And he says in verses 1 through 2, then, then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I may perform these signs of mine among them, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your grandson how I made a mockery of the Egyptians and how I performed my signs among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. Then he goes in on to these, the locusts, and then the darkness. And this is a fascinating just two couple of verses because it, it, it tells us obviously that the Lord is sovereign. That he's sovereign over man's heart, human heart. I hardened his heart and the heart of his Pharaoh, and this his servant, excuse me. It, it also shows us how powerful he is. To, he sends his signs, and in, in other verses, he says his wonders. It also tells us that there is an actual purpose going on, a teaching purpose, that the reason why he's doing it is that you can, he says in verse 2, you may tell in the hearing of your son, and literally your son's son, how I made a mockery of the Egyptians and how I performed my signs among them, that you may know that, you may know that I am the Lord. And, and really, so it's, it's leading up. Yes, God is great and powerful. We've seen that, how he is sovereign over human hearts. That there is a teaching point in this. But what is he teaching? I sat there and I really wrestled with verse 2. Is, is what is being said here that God is showing himself to be without rival? Could that be it? 
Is he saying that there's no, no equal to him? We've already talked about them, that there's no one like him. What is he saying? And really, so I began to wrestle with this, this one verse, excuse me, this one word, which is actually in the English, four words. I made a mockery. Now, it's translated in various ways. Make sport of, show my mighty acts. They're all wrestling with what this, what this word is expressing. This word actually describes taking a drink time and time again. That's the, the more, that's the physical actual interpretation of that word. Um, it's just taking a drink. And yet it's applied metaphorically that as someone would take drink and drink again, they are satisfying themselves. It's applied to not only drink, it's applied to the action of the flesh, of lust. This is what is, this is the same word that is used in Judges when the, the concubine of the Levite is given into the cities of um, Benjamin and is basically abused by all the men of, of Benjamin, they, they basically continue to go at and hurt her, abuse her. It's also used of the Lord in the action that he takes, that he continues to do something until he accomplishes the end for which he was intending. Now, in, in many ways, we can see how this makes sense. For as his repeated action goes, he's making sport. He's showing his mighty deeds. He's making a mockery of the Egyptians. And I, I really was resting. I was like, okay, so, so what is this, Lord? How are you, what are you making known about yourself? And really, I was trying to think of a quality what kind of quality is this? Because this is kind of like, ooh, wow, what, what is this? But, but then it, it began to hit me that, I, that rather than a quality, this is actually exposing a, a action of manner. That is, he is saying that through his repeated action against the Egyptians and performing his signs, we're going to know him. That we're going to know who he is, that I am the Lord. And this is where I sat back and began to consider uh, of, of what, of the whole of the book of Exodus. And not just the particular one-off signs, or maybe even all the signs. What is he doing in the plagues? He is seeking to make himself known to Pharaoh in Egypt and to his people. That's where I came back and began to see, wow, wait a minute. God isn't hardening Pharaoh's heart for kicks. <laughs> he, he isn't multiplying his signs because he has to. Why is he doing this? He is doing this to make himself know, or another way to say it, that you might know that I am the Lord. And that's where I come to my point this evening. Why does God act? He acts to make himself known to us. And you may say, well, Pete, I guess I knew that. But understand, you know, God is so other than us. He is not like us at all. There's no one like him. Remember, he's utterly and completely unique. You can't begin to parallel him to something because it's off. It's wrong. He is so distant, so he's independent of all creation. How then are we to know him? We are to know him in the way he acts. You want to know what God's like? Look what he has done. Look how he shows himself. And th this is what we began. This is actually a huge lesson, lesson that is, is developed largely in the New Testament, particularly in John's gospel that speaks about how, how, how no man has seen God at any time, but the Lord Jesus Christ, he has made him known. That is, as Jesus amazingly uses those I am statements himself, echoing back to the book of Exodus, 
What he is saying is, you want to know who I am, look at what I'm doing. And see, really, Jesus makes known to us the fullness of God's action, the fullness of God's revelation. Jesus makes known to us the immortal, invisible, the one that we cannot lay our eyes upon. But yet, in Jesus Christ, we are able to fully know him. God acts so that he may be known. So it comes down to our practical life. How are you going to know who God is? You know, people these days are saying, I want to know who God is. How do you know God? Well, you have to look to his actions. You know, the best place to look for God, to know him, is in his word. Because in his word is recorded the the actions of redemption history, how he has made himself known. You want to know God? Read his word. And and it's, 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 it's fascinating People who, quote, want to know the Lord aren't reading the scriptures. How are you going to know him if you're not reading his word? You can't know him. Really, you're just living life on a prayer. But that, that's another way that you can get to know him. As as you pray to him and seek him, God will make himself known to you. Beloved, I, I, I can remember a time in my early life when I was not a Christian, and many times God condescended and answered my prayer and made himself known to me personally. I'll tell you one of them. Um, You probably didn't know this, but I was a very angry child. Maybe you look at my children and you say, well, there you go. Well, but I was a very angry child. And about third or fourth grade, I knew that I had a problem with anger. And my mom and dad were constantly telling me, growling. I would growl at my parents. It was terrible. It was terrible. And it became apparent to me as I spent more and more time sleeping in the living room, away from my brothers and sisters, right? Um, away from them. I was as part of my punishment that I have a problem. And you know, my, my parents believe in God, and I, I need to, too. And I need to, Lord, I need help. Would you help me and take away my anger? I've got a problem. I did, Jesus was not Lord of my life. Jesus was not my Savior. And yet, in praying, that, you know what the Lord did? It was like, it was as if magic or better. It was the Lord. Because my anger was gone. It was gone. And the Lord can do that with smoking. The Lord can do that with addiction. The Lord can do these things. What is the Lord doing? He is making himself known to you. He's showing himself. He's condescending to you. It was amazing. He didn't have to do anything for me. And there's many other ways that I prayed throughout time and I, I, I can tell you them later. They are crazy. They are crazy. Even dreams, crazy. But the Lord continued to make himself known and answer prayer. Why does he do that? He is making himself known. I am amazed how God condescends. It's all condescension. God is great. And yet he has condescended and made himself known to us. And you can know him. I tell you, this really spurred on my prayer this past couple of days, right? And that maybe that's what we need to be praying for. Lord, maybe like Moses, show me your glory. And what did God do? He showed him his glory. We'll come to that later. But he made himself known. Perhaps that's what you need to start praying as maybe God may feel a little bit distant from you. I'm not saying, you know, Lord, submit to my, my individual needs. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying, Lord, move on my timetable. I'm not saying that. But as we call out to him, what God is doing in answering that is he is making himself known. But this is also what really chaps, makes angry our Lord is that as he makes himself known, some people harden their hearts. Now, isn't, this, isn't this the kind of the background of that unforgivable sin? 
like the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. What is that? Why is that so problematic? Because God is making himself known and people don't want to know him. They don't want to admit it's him. And that's exactly what's going on with Pharaoh, right? Isn't that what's going on with Pharaoh? Here we're just looking throughout the rest of the passage. I mean, yes, he does at one point here. He admits that he sins, but he hardens his heart again, verse 18. He, 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 he even says, okay, go serve your flocks. Go do this in the, with the darkness as well. But he hardened his heart again in 27. I mean, this is what is so challenging and so, so wrath-provoking is that as God condescends, man says no. You know, God is so merciful, he makes himself known. But perhaps maybe the problem is with us. It's with our hardness of heart and listening to him. Like Pharaoh, we, 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 we pray for him to act, and we aren't looking for it. Or when he acts, we say, well, that's just the just cause of circumstances. It, it really isn't the answer to prayer. I wish I could tell you my next thought, but I can't. You will know him by reading his word and seeing him act. You will know him fully in and through the Lord Jesus Christ, how he reveals him fully. And as you pray, God will continue to condescend and make himself known to you. God acts to make himself known. You know, beloved, perhaps this is a good thought to leave this point on. God wants you to know him. He isn't trying to make himself hidden. But as you prayerfully seek him and read his words, he will make himself known. And you will see how the fullness of him is found in Jesus Christ. God acts to make himself known. But the other point here, as we look at the rest of the passage, you're going to say, how, how can we cover the rest of the passage in just this short amount of time? Well, I have a point that would encompass it all. And is this, that our Lord is Lord of even devastation and darkness. Our Lord is even Lord over devastation and, uh, and darkness. So on the surface here, it's, it's very enticing just to look at the individual plagues, to look at the devastating locusts, that how they... In, in verse 5, will eat the rest of what has escaped and what is left to you from the hail, and they will eat every tree which sprouts for you out of the fields, and your houses will be filled, and your houses, and your houses of all your servants, the house of all the Egyptians, and nothing will be like it in all the day. It's, it's easy to get into the, the details of this. You can talk about the darkness and how the darkness is, is a darkness, verse 21, that's going to be felt, and we could talk about the fear of these things. How God can control the locust with even just the wind. We could talk about how perhaps maybe God actually controlled the darkness. It doesn't tell us. It doesn't tell us at all. We could speculate. But rather, I think we are to appreciate this late in the plague game. That the Lord here is doing something marvelous. So marvelous that he is even willing to employ as his servants devastation and darkness to make himself known. And th that's what we pick up here. We, and we see devastation, verse 7. That Pharaoh's servants say, How long will this man be a snare to us? Let the men go, that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not realize that Egypt is destroyed, devastated? Do you not see this? Pharaoh, even further, he, he understands that th this is a huge plague. Verse 17, now therefore, please forgive my sin only this once and make supplication to the Lord your God that he would only remove this death from me. I mean, he sees it. This is terrible. And this darkness which covered all the land of Egypt for three full days. I mean, darkness, whoo. They worshiped the God of the sun. That was... The, Pharaoh was the embodiment of the god Ray. And we could talk about that. But really, how God controlled that, and yet, 
what does this say about our God? That he is even over both death and devastation and darkness. I need to step back at this moment and appreciate what God can do. And that so often we have a view of God that is just really just too small and what he can do. We offer up to him prayers about, hey, Lord, would you do this? Would you help me here? Would you give me direction with this and with that? And really, our prayers are boxing God in. If we take to heart the first point that our God acts to make himself known, shouldn't we pray big in accordance with how great he is that he can make himself known? And really, can God not use even death and devastation and darkness for, towards his good ends to make himself known? Yes. Beloved, God has a big toolbox. Or perhaps, children, you think of your favorite superhero who has those, that tool belt and all those little nifty gadgets that he can use. Our God doesn't need the grappling hook or the gun or whatever it is. Our God can use darkness to accomplish his purposes. Our God can use devastation and death to accomplish his purposes. Our God is indeed great. Who is like him? Now this is terrifying. This is rightly terrifying. Anyone who who has experienced death and darkness and devastation. Who is like this God? And God is known to have used these tools throughout history. When does he start using them? When hard hearts refuse to listen. Isn't that what he's doing here? The eighth and the ninth plague. He's about to go far, to go too far as death, the last one. He spoke of death in in a way through the locusts, and he's about to accomplish that through the death of the firstborn. God's going to use these men to accomplish his purposes. But what is one of his purpose? He's attacking hard-heartedness. Verse 3, thus the Lord says, thus says the Lord, the God of Hebrews, how long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they might serve me. For if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your territory. I will do this. This is what I'm doing. And really here's where we begin to notice what we said otherwise, that God has increased the level of plagues, that its intensity upon Pharaoh. And we are to understand that Pharaoh's heart is beginning to crack, is it not? His pharaohs, the, his servants' heart are cracking, verse 7. He, in verses 8 through 11, he calls them back in because he, for a moment, listens to them and says, okay, okay, fine, you, just the men can go. And then he realizes they, they'll all of them want to go, verse 10, and says, thus the Lord, may the Lord be with you if I ever let you go, you and your little ones. Take heed, for in his mind, evil is intended. He cracks further later on and he asks for forgiveness. He even comes back again. Go serve the Lord in verse 24. Only let your flocks and your herds be detained, even your little ones. But he hardened his heart. Why does God use those other more drastic means in his toolbox or tool belt? To attack our hard hearts. That's what he's doing. You know, some people say that they have to uh, take the school of hard knocks, right? What school did you graduate from, hard knocks? Because of our hardness of heart. Oh, that we would learn to listen. You know, I, I find it remarkable that as we're looking here at Exodus, and it is recorded for God's people, that God later on in covenant curses will bring upon God's people locusts and darkness for them. Did you notice that? I mean, you probably thought of that. You thought of the covenant curses in Deuteronomy 28, 
You thought of the minor prophets who speak of the armies that are coming from Assyria and Babylon. It's described as locusts devouring the land. You probably thought of that. You probably thought, uh, thought of the prophecy uh, spoken of in the prophets concerning how when Christ will come, there's great darkness in the land. What is God doing? He is pre prevailing heavy upon the people. Hard-heartedness. What do you think God is doing in our day? Hard-heartedness he is dealing with. You know, I, I find a delight in the New Testament how these locusts and, and this darkness reappears. How God continues to use, to use these tools. You, you remember what the announcer, the, the forerunner of Jesus was eating? Locusts. He was eating the locusts, showing the New Testament error and how, despite the great curses, this new covenant is going to uh, overcome, consume itself all the curses. And you, you know, it, it is phenomenal, not only that, as you think of the darkness that prevailed over the land for three days, but think of the darkness that came upon Golgotha for three hours, Luke 23, 44 when Jesus was hanging there upon the cross. I mean, here is God demonstrating his action again. He's acting, he's showing himself. And how is he showing himself the greatest? In Christ Jesus, who dies for hard-hearted people. Stubborn, difficult people. Oh Lord, may you forgive us for our hard hearts. Please, Lord. Why do we keep on going with our hard-heartedness? I mean, here is God being so gracious, time and time again. He brings us to the school of hard knocks. He points us to Christ. Oh, that we may embrace him. He is the Lord of even devastation and darkness. I want you to know, the Lord says, that I am the Lord. Look unto me and be saved all ends of the earth. Let's pray together. Lord, this is a difficult passage. And what can we indeed learn about you? We pray, O oh Lord, that you continue to make yourself known to us. We, we need you. We need you, O oh Lord, to prevail upon our hard-heartedness. We need you, O oh Lord, to break us down and help us to see more of Christ, to love him more than hardening. We pray, O oh Lord, that we'd see more of you now as you would make yourself known in and through the Lord's Supper. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.